Guess we have here this morning. I know we have some because I hear Michelle's classes hanging around. Good deal. We'll start with introductions on the guests. Welcome. Let me get to give us your name, though. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Hank. Hank, welcome. <laughs> another, another class member from Michelle Renault. It's to you. Thank you, Dale. Any other guests? Uh, Noah, KB5, BHQ. Not even here before. We always consider you guests. You're sort of family. <laughs> 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 That's good, though. It's good to have you back. David Barbie, Investigator. Welcome, Good deal. Any others? Well, it's good to have you here. As you can tell, it's a popular place on Saturday mornings, especially on game days. <laughs> and we'll start with introductions. Why don't you go ahead and start off, John? John WD5HCI. Dave N5ZZM. Oh, Dave N5ZZM. Denny WA6DK. Vince A0DKR. Patricia W5UVI. Philip W7PCF. Hold him to you, come in the thing. Yay! Jim, W5JLK. Lee, W5HLG, and it was slash AD. Okay, before we jump here, we have a couple here. Don, second. Meeting Kilo Delta Five Uniform Golf Game. Okay, and then back to back here. Bill, get that group started. Have your name. Oh, uh, Conrad, that's his seven WLM. Oh, sure. 85 UGO Bill. Jeff, 85 CKK. Aubrey, KF5 BJH. Richard, Kilo Five Romeo Hotel Alpha. Harold, W5 I from Marnie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bing, November, India, five golf. Hell, hey. Michelle, W5, MQC. Chris, K5, JZN. Ken, N5, KGK. Ken, K, W, G, E. Mike, N5, S, O, F. Rodney, K, F, I, U, Z, A. K5 MAS Mike. Rock K5 RJ Elf. Royce W5 L. John N2 MIC. Sam W5 DDR. Harvey KD5 SSB. Chris KC5 DID. Bob W5 EEZ. Royce KK5 Chiefs. Kilo Golf 5, Sierra Sierra Pursuit. Uh, Fred KC5 FPJ. Larry W5 Alex King. Uh, November 5 Alpha Quebec Bill. Doug WX5 BF. Oh, uh, Peter N5 U double one. Excuse the fans, they're all in the name. Bill WG5 B. Gary, WB5ULK. As opposed to Dr. Payne, who are on the ball. Thank you. <laughs> Kim, November 5, Oscar Papa. Jim, N2EST. Wayne, KK5, IOS. KF5, BMJ. Thomas, KF5, AIF. Lucas, 
Jerry, N5 JXS. Thomas, Alpha Gold 5, and Julia. Taylor, go to your next slide. I can move on. You got Mark over there, Heidi? Mark, N5 H7. I'm Ed, 85, Delta Mitchell, whereas Peter, when you need another TV, 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 And for the guests, don't worry, there is not a test. <laughs> if you learn all this group, we, we've got challenges. Members, okay, if you have not paid your dues, Jeff is our treasurer is out today working the ball game, which means we, we definitely won't see much this month. Uh, he has notes says if you have not paid your dues, what are you waiting on? Please do so. See him. Find the website, Mark's got stuff there. Find Jeff. Uh, if you have not verified your member info, make sure we get for you because I obviously email your time. If you haven't noticed that, that's probably your email does as well. Announcements. Did I see Norbert anywhere? Mark, you got Mike and S. Can we have I got Mike and S. You want me to talk to the mic? Yes. Yeah. The mic for Mike. That's right, Mike for Mike. Mike for Mark. Uh, Mike MS is an event where we're going to do public service. We're going to do information. Uh, we're going to have probably six of us doing communications on next Saturday and next Sunday. Runs from 8 in the morning till about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. We're always looking for some more folks. We're going to detail everything out. If you're wanting to be, if you have signed up, for Mike MS, please see me after this fine event, and we'll get all that good stuff going. We have uh, approved, board approved, and we are building for the Saturday event uh, five 25 uh, watt radios with mobile antennas that have suction cups that go on the side of a uh, aluminum van vehicle, so we can uh, provide equipment if you just want to show up with your license and uh, or your license uh, skills is probably the right answer. We'd be happy to have you. Next Saturday and Sunday. Um, who here has done a bike MS? There you go. If you're all, everybody has got your hand up, see me afterwards. <coughs> we provide communications for a 170 mile bike race, a bike run over those two days. With that statement of we provided some new radios, we also have an event to use those radios in another month. And that would be, Doug? That would be the. Uh Chasing the Storm, the 5K or 10K run that the National Weather Museum and Science Center is sponsoring. And it'll happen on October 21st at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. And so we'll need some volunteers to uh, run some radios and help us out on communications on that day. So if you're interested in helping on that event. Uh, we're also having a banquet that evening for the Weather Hall of Fame. We've had three new inductees, uh, Joe Friday, uh, Tom McNellis, and uh, Jim Cantori from the Weather Channel have been inducted into our Hall of Fame. So we'll be having a banquet that night out at the Coastal Training Center. Uh, if you go to our website, you can sign up and come to that too. We appreciate the support. So <coughs> thank you. So we got two things <coughs> coming up. It's a lot of fun. The bike mass rides to the beer against it. This is one of the smaller rides they'll have. Starting next year, Mark, we'll go back up toward Tulsa. Next year, we'll be towards uh, Tulsa somewhere. And the size of the city to Tulsa. So it'll be a longer. Yeah, the number of riders will go up drastically. So it's a good beer to jump in. Okay, the fall picnic coming up on October the 13th. Be right after. That's right for a meeting. We'll have a meeting that morning. Then we'll have the fall picnic at. We haven't really it's a, got a full name, Denny, but what do you call your grounds? Denny's place. Denny's place. There you go. Denny's place. 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 Denny's it's also the week of the Backfish event, so Michelle will not be at the picnic, not because she didn't like our food, oh. but we will also see if we can use Denny gear to see if we can contact Backfish that, that day. So. Yeah, the YLs will be meeting uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th. We'll be staying on the USS Batfish and calling CQ in memory of the USS Wahoo and the USS El Dorado. They're doing the 52 subs. So all the YLs will be up there. So it's submarine weekend. The YLs will be there. We will see if we get a hold of them. Sounds like fun. Take measure your yachting kits. Mark, I know you still have. 30 school. Yeah. Good deal. Ten bucks. 
That means one day soon we'll have to have some kind of fox hunting going on because we've got all these joggies now out wild. We will be using them. Secretary minutes. That's where I start bike sharing. Somewhat carefully. All right. Last month we had 47 <laughs> members and guests present. V4 for ham holiday. There was four new technicians, two upgrades to general, and one upgrade to amateur extra. A uh, regular test session had one new technician and one upgrade to general. The YL RL conference had one new technician, which was Michelle's granddaughter, and one upgrade to general. And then Peter showed everyone a bar graph of uh, the past years of health, ham holiday test sessions. Uh, core report ham holiday was up 10% in attendance. Uh, they had to move two forum rooms upstairs to open space for more tables, and all the forums were still packed. The uh, core meeting was after the last meeting at 1 o'clock to discuss the location for next year's amateur radio ham holiday. And they had two promising sites, the Embassy Suites in Norman and a conference center in Edmond that is partially owned by the city of Edmond. <coughs> The uh, tech committee, they disconnected the club's duplexers at the repeater site and replaced them with a surplus duplexer from <coughs> 5MS. That changed nothing with the issues that were going on. Um, they also pulled the controller and sent it in for warranty work and replaced the controller back uh, <coughs> with some configurations needing to be adjusted. Uh, as Peter said, one thing that has been identified is there's three interfering noises and the controller has corrected one of the three noises. Uh, old business. Uh, John received a call from the Boys and Girls Club in Norman. They have several kids interested in getting a license, and so we will be in contact with them. Uh, program was two radios by Conrad. Uh, Michelle, for announcements, Michelle gave a rundown of the 2018 YL conference. They had 43 YLs and 23 OMs attend the conference and had many good information sessions that was very well attended. <coughs> and then Mark announced about the Bike MS event that he just spoke about. And he also spoke about Elmer, Elmer's Night at the Red Cross building. That's planned to be Tuesday night, 6.30 to 9-ish. Uh, the Red Cross building will be open for people to show up and learn more about amateur radio. Uh, they're needing volunteers to be an Elmer. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to know more than the new guy. So right. they plan on starting this Tuesday after this meeting. And then October 13th will be the fall picnic with... This is food at six. We're doing it after this. Okay. And the meeting ended at 11 23. I think the uh, beginning time is we started when was four o'clock we started, Denny. Good enough. It officially ends at when they go home. Yes. One I think we said last time we officially ended at eight o'clock, even though some of us couldn't tell eight, we left closer to 11 So some of us didn't seem to want to leave. We enjoyed the time. Any questions or amendments to our meet our minutes? I'm not a question about that, but I'm wondering to know where the map is located. It's in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Okay. I'll entertain motions. Except the minutes. All in favor? Deal. Yeah. The treasury report. Normally, Jeff emails us to me. Apparently, he was off on duty earlier this morning, so he has signed. So our treasury board will have uh, next month. I'll try to send out an email to his new email once I get it from him. B reports, Peter. Yes, we had a test session this past Thursday night. We had eight candidates, four of whom upgraded their licenses to general, including Lee, uh, and four of whom are new technicians. The license is posted about 12 hours after the test session. 12 hours. Woo! A new record. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's nominal. Yeah. So yeah. So the the I think we can say that the the choice of uh, Laurel Amateur Radio Club's VEC versus ARRL's VEC, I think that was a good choice. 
And it's been very positive thing so far. Worked out very well. Core report, Mark. I know there's not a lot to report on necessarily since we didn't meet this. We don't meet this time. We don't meet back until January, but the Cora is the people put on ham holiday every year. Uh, each club where one of those has three opportunities to bring folks. What? Define Cora. We will. Cora is set to where you open the Cora is the Central Oklahoma Radio Amateurs. Uh, that group puts on the ham holiday event. We have three members that are on that board. Uh, actually, we have four because I'm president. And we get three other members. We reported last month that we had really two really good leads. That's unfortunately false because they fell off into the end of the earth since then. Uh, i got five or six more that I'm chasing. have nothing detailed yet, but I know it's not going to be at Edmond because they won't let us in because we charge money. So that's not going to work there, which means hopefully we can still do Norman or three or four areas on the south side of town. So Ham Holiday is a year away. Uh, our friends down in Ardmore, uh, October 4th, I believe is the right date. For the first weekend in October, have a, a ham fest oh, nice. in Ardmore. 2627. Uh, Ardmore? Uh, Ardmore. Yes. Okay, like I said, it's the last. <laughs> Sometime in October. Sometime in October. 2627. Thank you. It was in the newsletter yesterday. We have a newsletter? No. <laughs> really? You should put that out weekly. I should. And then maybe people would get used to getting a newsletter on a weekly basis. I think that's the problem. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> it's, it's sometime in October. Uh, so if you're looking for ham fest fix, that should be a good one to uh, buy, sell, trade, or uh, or just go down there and, and have a hot dog or something. I'm sure it is. Yeah, it's hardware problem. And you can find tickets on sale now at TexomaHamaRama.org. Right? It's easy. Uh, I, know, I think they're in the door, at the door. They're also doing that as well. They are run really strange. They are run by the people that show up. So if you show up, you can be a board member and you can run next year's event, which is really a weird way to do that. So if you wish to help them, they are looking for help all the time. Mr. Craig, are you going up? Is that like defining or was the majority of the members present? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> it's a recursive definition. I think. They've been doing this for 72 years. Yeah. It's really strange, but it works. So and they if have one of the best facilities. Yeah, they got awesome facilities. <laughs> Really cheap. We could use it. It'd be great if we moved to Armour. Um, if, there you go. Um, it, it is a great little ham fest, and uh, it, it's worth the trip. And to put the in my core, did he actually give? Okay. Yes. We will try to do that for you. We'll try not to get too bad for you. However, always feel free to stop and ask what was that. Okay, technical committee report. Peter, you heard Christmas, you need to add to this. I'm trying to remember when Mark and I went up there. Mark Wimley. <laughs> I think it was October 26th or 27th. <laughs> Uh, it would have been before. before. Okay, so I must the report. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so we yeah. Work on yeah. Last night. yeah. Uh, Mark, Mark, and I need. <laughs> yes, we know that the the time up timer is moved up. Error, error, error. error. The, good the time is, is now. The time is highly accurate if you lived on the west coast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this was actually. A Problem before, and that was fixed by the, the, the back to the manufacturer, who is instantly in the time. Uh, so, that, so that's good news. So, when we finally do actually get the report to work and get a good configuration in there, we'll actually be able to use the timer again and, and not have to worry about the clock being wrong. Good deal. I like where it reminds me of what took place. That's right. Good reminder. Same for the non scientists in the room, this is a good definition of. Sort of an example of the definition of difference between the size. It's not accurate. Okay, net reports. Jesse, Jim for the 60 reports. No Jim. No Jim. Bing's here. Bing's here. I'm here. Go for it. Might want to jump on the 6 meter net Monday night, 8 o'clock. Yeah, 6 meter net, guys. A lot of fun. 
Uh, 50.200 sideband, 8 o'clock on Mondays, and uh, we've been getting 10 to 12 check-ins uh, when 13 when baby's not out of town or somebody. But uh, yeah, come on by if your radio's six meter capable, yeah, or you have an antenna up. Uh, but, um, come see us. It's good I've been the week one in the last. I know there's a lot of people that have the radios that are capable, but their antennas are in the barn or in the backyard on the ground or something. They've been there for five or six years, so they yeah, resemble that. I know. <laughs> to that, I know who you are. To that end, Michelle has got a Moxon antenna uh, kit that I put on the antenna page for the scars uh, portion. So if you need a six meter antenna that's made out of PVC and wire, right? How much yes. it cost you, John? Uh, maybe about twenty, thirty dollars. PVC and wire, and it works good for you. Works well. Yeah, it works well. So it's on the antenna page. If you need uh, Harold's little reminder to get you home. Jill, <coughs> Harry's and Phil. Harry that happens Tuesday evening, eight p.m. local time on one forty-seven point oh six zero. The car is repeater. Um, we average about 38 check-ins. That, that net um, is a net where you can get a lot of information and other uh, all kind of information on weather and stars and activities going on and such. Last Tuesday night, uh, we had John and Michelle's class check in, which is great. Thank you very much. And I hope you continue to do that. We had 52 check ins last Tuesday night. Dang. So the, um, the net control operators are doing a great job. Uh, the net's quick and right along. We're getting it done in a half hour, and everything's good. Thank you. Excellent. Gossip Nets. There's a question over there. Oh, okay, there's a question over there. Everybody's funny. <laughs> I don't want to say okay. I just wanted to clarify it's on the SCARS 2 main repeater. Yes. Just for the main people, because we had more than one. Thank you. On the 2 meter. Gossip Nets. I don't know, Jimmy, it's all small. You've got Chris back here. Chris, you want to hit Gossip Nets? Sure. Uh, again, it's on the uh, SCARS 2 meter repeater, though, so. so. Uh, it's all in the area net, uh, about 8.30 or so, uh, roughly, we say we're about 13, 18 to 20 check-ins on average on that, and uh, how we Great job. Bill, 10 meter net. Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock, we have the 10 meter net on 28.445, upper side band, no telling who. Who will show up? Uh, North order BX. Again, Jill Peter Siren that Siren that every Saturday at noon. Weather and football permitting. There's football today, so there'll be no audible test in Norman. <coughs> if I go in and turn off the radio, as Mr. Grizzle asked me to, uh, <laughs> and there will possibly be no net in more on whether or not. The weather clears out. Uh, okay. So more is depending upon current weather conditions. Yes, Mr. Kitch is in this room somewhere. And at he would at the current time, there is no audio test that yeah. he decides to clear out. You might provide that. So it's not like no siren nets today unless for some miraculous reason it clears out. Yes. So, Michelle, why not? Oh. Uh, uh, looking, for people. looking for people, yes. Uh, uh, W5NOR.org slash siren. Uh, there is a list and a map for both cities. Uh, and if there's no call sign next to the siren that's near your house, sign up. So it's about the siren. <laughs> <laughs> Comes in handy. YL nets. There's several great YL nets out there for any YLs in the room. Tuesday nights is the uh, ladies on the air net on the Canopla system or on Echolink. 
there is Wednesday night, there's an HF ladies net, eight o'clock on 14.288. Thursdays is an echo link net on the YL op net on the Alora node. And then Saturdays, there's a worldwide YL DMR net at 10 o'clock. All great nets, ladies only. Thank you. Go through and go through all your acronyms because that was acronym late. <laughs> YL, young ladies. What other one did I say? YLRL. Young ladies radio league. DMR. Digital mobile radio. And OEM. Maybe an OEM. The room is filled with them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And last but not least, Jim Lee. The DMR areas next. On Monday nights at 8.15 on Top Group 3140 DMR, we have the statewide Aries net. Uh, this week we'll be uh, continuing on with the uh, uh, doing a, a building a go bag, and so this week will be the third installment of building a go bag. So if you have uh, DMR capability, we'd love to hear from you. Eight fifteen Monday nights, uh, talk through thirty one forty. In case you're curious, it is possible to do the. Six meter net and the Aries net simultaneously, which I've done some time as long as you grab the right mic. <laughs> <laughs> Same okay. can be said for the ladies on the air and the Aries net. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Okay, DX. Anybody got any DX lately? <coughs> they were on last five. night. Group 66 on the air is going yeah. on, I believe. Yes, sorry, it started this weekend, weekend, right? What contest, what DX contest is happening right now? Ireland, Spain, they were all on last night. Okay. Okay, okay. Mark, you're up again for the Red Cross report. Microphone, please. Taking that, yeah. Smoker, you got it. We have a last right last meeting the, the uh, Friday before the meeting we had really good news which was we were getting the larger room at the Red Cross to do our radio work. Uh, a week later, had another meeting with them and they gave us both the current room that we have, the smaller room, and the larger room, which is really awesome. Uh, subsequently, we have done some significant repairs and remodeling. Uh, Patricia and Ed and Mark have been the three driving that bus. Uh, we were going to open up Tuesday. We're going to push it back about two weeks because we've got so much stuff that's happening this month. No so, doubt, straight off the cliff. Struck the way we do it. I said, no doubt, straight off the cliff. Drive it straight off the cliff. That's what we intend to do. <laughs> the, uh, the really good news is we got two rooms. The first room, the larger room, the one in the corner, the newest one to us, is going to be built, or it is built, with two operating stations, one that will have my couple that has been field tested and uh, it does its proper thing. It's been in great shape. It will be hooked to the 10, 15, and 20 meter beam uh, that's up on top of the tower. It will also be hooked to a 2 meter, 440, and a 6 meter antenna, so we can run all those higher bands on that its, uh, station. We have a second station in the same room, which is a Kenwood, a brand new Kenwood 530. It's a recently rebuilt Kenwood 530 um, that the we've gone through and very fine. It will be hooked to a 40 and 80 meter band dipole to get the lower band. So if you practice on running a tube radio, you can learn how to do those. Um, there will be a third station in the back of the build room, which is going to be a place where you can bring your own radio. So if you have a radio that you're not sure about, there'll be a power supply and an antenna connection and a, a dummy load to uh, burn up the Red Cross instead of your house, which is I always suggest to do with a new radio is take it to somebody else's house and then burn their place down. I had two or three guys try to do that. Mr. Bateman, remember Cameron tried to burn my house down? Yeah. So uh, I always use somebody else's house to do that. The long bench in that uh, small room is it will be set up for a build location with uh, soldering irons and those kind of things um, to come do your stuff. 
Um, we've outfitted a whole bunch of extras we'll talk about when we when you come visit the place. Um, it's going to be awesome. 25th, September 25th. Is 25th an acronym? No. no. Okay. So I don't have to explain what TH means. <laughs> okay. So September 25th is where we're going to start, 6.30 to 9. Uh, feel free to come. Uh, we're planning to do, do this on a weekly basis as we move forward. There'll be training. There'll be places where you can just operate if you want to come and operate or uh, test your own radio gear. So it should be a whole lot of fun uh, as we move forward. And where is it? The Red Clinton County Red Cross is at 1205 Halley Drive. Yeah, <laughs> just turn around and look through the fire truck. It's at the corner, what used to be the corner of Barry and um, Robinson before they goofed that all up um, 30 years ago. I'm still better. It's 30 years ago. Yeah. It takes me an extra 10 minutes to get there, but I did there. Um, the, uh, it's down there. It's where we did our field day this year. Uh, gives us tons of options for field days. We've got access to get cables in and out. We've got uh, 220 rigs. We're going to do stuff outside, so we got lots of good stuff. Uh, they've just got the the box van back, which is a cube van that has a 6,500 watt generator with air conditioner on board, and uh, we got a, a UHF radio on that system for them. So, uh, on that regard, yes, sir. Question: What about a CW rig, a room for CW? Uh, but more, the smaller room. Do you have anything set up for CW? Because we're trying to promote CW the, in our class. Both radios were set up for CW in the main operating room. But so, if you, you're talking voice, it's kind of hard to. In, in, a, in, a contest, in a contest or a field based situation, the goal would be to put CW into the smaller room. Um, the door. And lock the door. <laughs> and, <laughs> you've got a plan. We got a slot big enough to slide pizzas in for Bill and Kim <laughs> and Jim and Bing and all of those great CW folks. But in a, in a contest situation, um, the the concept is that that would be in that that room, and we have installed dry coax runs from station one to station two, station two to three, and, and what three back to one, so it's a loop. So any of the antennas can be picked up by any of the locations. And even better, Station 2 has a 4-inch square hole that goes out the building. So we can drop in um, a generator <laughs> plug if we want to run everything off generator, or if we want to run, you know, if the CW guys have uh, 10 antennas they want to drag through that hole, boom, we just drag it through the hole and off we go. So. Uh, yes, there is both of those options. So, like on a, a winter field day, we intend to try that where we put one set in one room and one set in the other. Yes, sir. From a pragmatic point, is there any plan to put an NGIS antenna for uh, 75 and 40? Uh, the, we've got a dipole, and I don't know I don't know the difference between an NGIS and a dipole. How high, how high is the uh, satellite 37 feet? Uh, let me try and put it successfully. That's not ideal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's, there's, oh, no, we're going to have an argument. No fighting, boys. Not, not, not what's there. Keep your, keep your, uh, we can do whatever we want out there. I like I like the Jerry be in charge of the end of the second move and second of the Jerry in charge of the end of the end. Let me know what you think, brother. Is that <laughs> yes, it does. Your vertical incident skyway. And the idea is you push all your signal up straight to the sky and it comes straight back down so that we can talk to more Oklahoma folks um, when we're having a local event disaster. No cone of silence. No cone of silence. That's just a cone of silence. They were teaching in all directions. <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. Now, the vertical range is about 800 kilometers plus or minus the sun cooperation. <clears throat> and it will never do that. Uh, <laughs> but if, if, oh, if you're interested, in being an Elmer, see me and we'll get you signed up to, to help that. We'll do more as we go on. Thank you very much. Okay, before we start today's program, I know Harold has donated some batteries up here to the club to sell. Uh, proceeds going to just get a bunch of an officer or things since our printer's out. But uh, he's been selling for 20 bucks. And apparently, I think he's been going through for quite a few. <laughs> And <clears throat> yeah, okay. For those of you who may not be aware, the National Standards and Technology 
those of you, so for those of you who don't know, WWV, WWVH, WWVB are time and frequency standard stations operated by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, I don't know where in Hawaii. Oh, wow. Can't be off by much. Uh, it's on that island somewhere. And um, currently, the current budget proposed for NIST uh, terminates those services. So WWD, WWDH, and WWDB would cease transmit. WWVB is the thing that runs all your atomic clocks. It's the thing that runs your atomic watches. It's the thing that runs your atomic time-linked appliances. If that stops, then your everything loses its its lock. And so I would, if if you don't want that to go away, I would urge you to write your representatives and say we want to keep it going. There, there, are, there are also a couple of petitions. Huh? Go on the internet. You can find a petition, and you can you can uh, execute it right online. Yes, there, there are two. Yeah, there are two <laughs> whitehouse.org petitions uh, for this that you can find online. Um, so, uh, whitehouse.org. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and, and you can go to there. There are two petitions about this that you can also electronically sign. So, so there. The deal. So Jerry, if you're up next, I'm going to bow out and go join your treasurer at the ball game. I'll play. I won't see. Yeah, if you're going to White House, White, White House .gov, Make sure you get .gov in there. You're going to find another industry that's compromised. Address. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jerry Greger at 5KXS. I'm also Oklahoma Wings uh, Assistant Director of Planning for Civil Air Patrol and U.S. Air Force Auxiliary. And I'm here to do a little bit of propagandizing and recruiting today. So, you have a clicker for me, Mark? I do not. I will be your clicker. Next slide, please. Thank you, sir. Slide Just to keep this thing moving, if there are questions, interrupt me. Let's talk about them as we go, and we'll, uh, we'll make this as much fun, and I'll try not to put too many people to sleep in the process. Civil Air Patrol came into being December 1st, 1941. Yes, before Pearl Harbor, although we dropped bombs on submarines, but that's another story. Uh, as an auxiliary to the Army Air Corps and an element of civil defense, Figueroa LaGuardia had the idea to do this, pushed it through, and it was uh, approved by the uh, Department of War and the uh, uh, individually by the Army and, uh, and Navy and, and Coast Guard. Approved by the President, Congress turned it into a 501c3 and under, uh, I remember correctly, Title 32, uh, which makes it an organization of, uh, that's chartered by Congress to, uh, to do the tasks that we're told to do, except when we're doing something specifically for the Air Force. But I'll get to that in a bit. During World War II, we had a number of missions. Anti-submarine patrol. We actually sank two submarines, cool. as in dropping initially submarines. Then the Navy decided maybe we ought to try and drop bombs on submarines, and they actually rigged little yellow airplanes to uh, drop bombs on submarines. Over a uh, uh, hundred submarines were sighted, and uh, the uh, and bombs were dropped. Only two were hit. Two were sunk. In the end, because of the harassment by those little yellow airplanes, among other things, the Germans decided they'd had enough of this nonsense and uh, withdrew their uh, submarine patrols. 
search and rescue. We still do that today. Emergency transport of personnel and cargo, we do today. We're down there periodically as well. Air defense as targets. Well, <laughs> yeah, we still do that. Uh, actually, in uh, national capital area, periodically we'll get a, a mission from the Air Force that says, we want you to go fly in the restricted area. When? Now. Oh, okay. And the F-16s don't know we're, go we're going to go do this until they get up and see our airplanes. Observation and training support for Army units, that's starting to pick up. Forest fires, that's, well, we're there. Flight training, we have a brand new initiative from the Air Force that says we're going to do that for cadets and try and help rebuild the pilot population. How many people are aware of the fact that we have a minor problem with pilots today? Myers, Myers. Yeah. yeah, it is. The airlines can't get enough of them. The Air Force can't get enough of them. The Navy can't get enough of them. It, now, it, Army pardon? now Army helicopter pilots. Uh, those and turn them into jet pilots, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, cadet programs in aerospace education. All of this was part of the original charter in, back in 1941, before seven day, uh, six days before Pearl Harbor. In 1946, under Public Law 476, it became incorporated as a true nonprofit, and in 1948 was officially recognized as, as a civilian auxiliary of the United States Air Force. Of course, we had to wait until we had a United States Air Force for it to be recognized then. Most of the core of World War II missions are still CAP Corps missions. Next slide, please. <laughs> 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 so under Title 36 U.S. Code, we're a federally chartered corporation serving communities when we're not actually acting under, under a federal response. But when we are activated under a federal response, we actually become... Uh, a, a vol the Volunteer Civilian Auxiliary of the Air Force under Title 10. What that means is at that point, I'm covered by, if the airplane falls out of the sky and breaks, they pay for it, I don't. If I'm hurt, they take care of that. And yes, I even get per diem if I'm on, uh, on, a, uh, on a mission that is mandated by the Air Force. The Civil Air Patrol shall be deemed to be an instrumentality of the United States with respect to any act or omission of the Civil Air Patrol, including any member of the Civil Air Patrol, in carrying out a mission assigned by the Secretary of the Air Force. In other words, every once in a while we get real. Next slide, please. A couple of years ago, in uh, 2014, Congress uh, decided to award the gold Congressional Gold Medal to CAP members who were active during World War II. The attendees for that included six, uh, 46 living vets, 55 families, and 600 people. Additional ceremonies have been carried out over the last, uh, well, up until 2017, to uh, make sure that the uh, Congressional Gold Medal was recognized in every wing in the country. There are 52 wings. We have a special one for Congress critters. Uh, and uh, over 200 veterans and families were recognized in these. Next slide, please. Membership statistics. This is a little bit old. This is from 2017. Today, well, as of two weeks ago, according to the Secretary of the Air Force, we had over 60,000 active members now in uh, Civil Air Patrol, including uh, senior members or officers and cadets. We have 1,445 units comprising national headquarters, regions. We have uh, six regions, uh, 52 wings. Who knows how many groups or squadrons? A bunch. In Oklahoma, we have one wing, two groups, and 13 squadrons, 16 squadrons of memory service. Overall, CAP has the largest fleet of Cessna airplanes in the world of single-engine Cessna airplanes in the world. We currently have 47 gliders and an active glider program, including a glider program here in Oklahoma. Uh, we have over a 1,000 
We've got Nywell 10,000 VHF radios and pretty close to 2,000 HF radios. We'll talk more about HF in a little bit. We can talk about VHF too. Next, next slide, please. We fly all sorts of toys. The Gippsland GA8 is primarily a people and stuff hauler. It's relatively slow, carries a lot of stuff, and is possibly the most uncomfortable single-engine airplane I have ever had the privilege of sitting in. The 182 is our workhorse airplane for search and rescue missions. The 172 is a trainer. It's what we tow our gliders with. It's also what we put our airborne repeaters in. Yeah, we fly two meter, what, what amounts to a two meter repeater every time we do an exercise or a real event. The Cessna 206s are used in mountainous terrain and they're also used when we uh, escort the, uh, the MQ 9 Reapers. MQ 9 Reaper, if it's going to be used in the continental United States, can only be used in designated restricted military or prohibited military areas. If it's going to fly from, say, Albany, New York, up to a, a restricted or prohibited area for a bomb range uh, practice, it's got to get there somehow. The only way it can get there legally right now is for us to escort the thing and keep eyeballs on the reaper. We use 206s for that and try to keep up. They're pretty quick. We actually have more of those missions coming up. They're called our uh, surrogate unmanned aircraft program and the escort program. And we have more of those coming up in Louisiana. We already have an active one in Ellington, at Ellington Field in Texas. They go off and play offshore, so we just have about a 60 mile left flight, turn them loose. And there's this place called Oklahoma City that is about to start flying reapers. Next slide, please. We have a bunch of places where we keep airplanes. The little icons more or less represent where we have airplanes or at least the facilities for aircraft. We can actually cover a lot of, uh, a lot of territory with the uh, airplanes we have and the sites we have available. Next slide, please. And we also have ground teams. If we have a disaster response or a request for search for a missing person, or if we have to go looking for an airplane, once we, you know, we found an ELT more or less location, we can't see anything from the air to direct people in, we can put our own ground teams in. Four to six people typically, and these include our cadets. We train our cadets to be ground team members. They can go out. They're very valuable because they pay more attention than a lot of our adults do to the rules and to how to do things properly. Um, I'm trying to be a little funny here, but I'll be honest. I'm actually, I'm being brutally honest. The adults tend to gloss things over and go, you know, I know all this. I don't have to learn this. Our cadets learn it. Put it into practice is a good thing. Makes it a whole lot easier for those of us who are trying to learn it and make sure we do it right every time. Next slide, please. So what do we do? How do we talk? We've got a repeater network across the country. Now, we're not, we don't fall under the FCC regulations for uh, uh, frequency operation. Kim mentioned NIST a few minutes ago. I have to fall under the NIST regulations because we get all of our frequencies from the Air Force. That's HF frequencies, VHF frequencies, the occasional UHF frequency, and some of the other things that we play with that are uh, as easily characterized. Let's, let's call them novel waveforms and just sort of leave it at that. <laughs> but there are novel waveforms out there that are a lot of fun. We have the capability, we have a repeater in Oklahoma City. We've got the, uh, about 16 scattered out around the, uh, the state. Some of them actually work pretty well. Some of them are a little challenging. Typically, they're at about 300 to 400 feet. Most of them have generator backup. And a bunch of them are going away. Because we're going to replace the repeaters with remote bases in a lot of cases and go to a linking system called ReadyOp that's very popular in the public safety world. And ReadyOp will give us the opportunity to link repeater sites or motivation repeater sites together 
bring them back into a central point for an incident commander to be able to sit in his uh, bunny slippers at the kitchen table and run an incident, a small incident from, from home and still talk to all of his assets out in the field. We have vehicles that can talk on VHF. They can also talk on HF. We have a lot of ALE radios. Who else is familiar with ALE? Okay, so we've got a cluster over here. Automatic link establishment is a mechanism to digitally sound a series of channels, figure out what channel happens to work best, and then catalog all of the stations it heard out there. And if you want to call, Gary, you punch in Gary's call sign and punch call, and it goes and tries to call it on the best channel. And if it doesn't find him on the best channel, it tries a backup channel. And it assumes that he's scanning all these channels too because he was out there when I did a uh, sound. <coughs> it's actually pretty useful when you've got a bunch of less than highly skilled video operators who have taken on the role of being almost always present to provide backbone, and that's part of what we've done. Uh, we can talk to partner agencies through through uh, local agreements and uh, MOUs. They can hand us a radio in some cases. Well, we ha we have the uh, VHF uh, tactical channels. And the Motorola's are cute, lightweight, and but we'll see. We got them for a great price, which is good because. Because we have a relatively small budget out of in the Air Force every year. For short to medium range, we can talk to the repeaters or we can talk simplex. If we need to go farther, we put it in an airplane, put that airplane at 10,000 feet and have him fly racetrack pattern over central Oklahoma. In fact, that's how I manage communications. Uh, next weekend, we're going to be doing an exercise in this room where we'll have teams out over half the state, and we'll have a second group over in Muskogee to back us up for a, an incident command post. That airplane high in the sky flying racetracks is going to be my primary communications mechanism to get from here to Muskogee on a reliable basis. Does it work? Well, we started doing this three years ago, and it's worked great that entire time. We'll also have an HF AOE system set up just in case. But if the sunspots don't cooperate, the chances of it working between here and Muskogee are kind of uh, sparse. We'll just have to see how it goes. We'll, be, we'll have it established. We can also uh, talk to partner agencies our uh, code flood capabilities, such as Coast Guard, or for that matter, Guard, the Army Guard, or the Air Force. We're beginning to uh, set up operations with uh, Guard communications so that we're easier we have an easier interface to them when something happens, you know, like 2013 more. We have a few hiccups trying to talk to uh, some of the other agencies at that point because we hadn't practiced it regularly. We learned from that. We set up an incident command post. We'll have a full NIMS qualified incident command post in this room next weekend, capable of handling a fairly low level, but we're Changing that structure too. We're actually starting to ramp up our training so that it meets the standard criteria for NIMS. So that if we have an incident commander walk in uh, who's requested to come in and handle a regular NIMS Category 3 incident, he can walk in and do it, whether it's Civil Air Patrol or a fire scene. We'll have that capability. I just went through Com L. Who's familiar with Com L training? Cool. I just went through COMEL uh, Type 3 training. For six months or less, when I get my task book signed off, I'll be in the National Registry. If they decide they need a COMEL and my wife will let me go out and play, then I will go wherever I get sent. And I'm supposedly at that point capable of handling that sort of an incident uh, as a communications leader. <coughs> And then we can talk to higher headquarters. Who, does that have, who is that higher headquarters? Well, it could be our National Operations Center. It could be uh, First Air Force at Tyndall Air Force Base. It could actually go to the Pentagon. But I want to talk about this for just a second. It seems that a couple of years ago, about 
almost four years ago now, decided that to make a problem with putting all of its communications assets on satellite and internet. <laughs> and they directed the Civil Air Patrol to start holding nets on a regular basis and ramp up its HF capability. To that end, we now do uh, 16 scheduled nets a week at the national level. Each wing is uh, supposed to do a net at least once a week. Uh, each region is supposed to do a net at least once, once a week. Squadrons are encouraged to do them frequently as well. These are all on HF. We also have VHF maintained. But on the HF networks, we do silly things like we actually pass traffic. We have random code groups that are put together and sent out from national that have to come back, go through the system, go to an individual addressee, and that individual addressee then has to enter them in within a time frame that has been dictated already. Good at it. Typically, we have between six and 50 uh, states actually on every net. We have representatives in there. We've got people who are on call in every wing state that uh, have an ALE radio on and can capture traffic. These are called our message center stations. We have beauty stations on our nationwide net, uh, which are called our triblade stations. And triblade stations are capable of receiving the uh, traffic anywhere it comes in and relaying it to the local uh, regions or wings so that it can be uh, disseminated as necessary. Oklahoma of late has been getting its uh, coded messages back into the system within about four hours because we got a couple of really dedicated people who get these, get on, make it happen. So September, the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Air Force called together with, okay, the Air Force is now going to become more interested in HF. Remember what I said about being a little bit worried about satellite communications and internet communications? The terminology the Air Force is using right now is planning for a really bad day. <laughs> what happens if a uh, player with malintent sets off a nuclear explosion at 300 nautical miles altitude? Everybody, anybody ever heard of HEMP? Yeah. Or EMP, electromagnetic pulse. The potential for destruction in that is pretty significant. It could take out, depending on who you want to read, satellites, power grids, anything connected to a power grid, anything that looks like a transistor, um, chickens, the occasional gopher. It, it, it could create a really bad day. The probability is the internet will not initially survive. Now, the internet is resilient and was designed for this sort of thing to happen, so it'll probably come back relatively quickly. But for that first six or eight hours, we got a problem. Similarly, at 300 nautical miles, the satellites at the time are going to have a problem. Oh, and by the way, what do you think it's going to do to the ionosphere? So what we're going to be looking at is how do we communicate? The Air Force is looking at the same thing. They, called, they put together a working group to study this problem involving one professor from Air University, about a half dozen pilots, because it is the Air Force after all, and the director of communications from Civil Air Patrol, because we'd already been directed to look at this problem and start setting up a network. The long and short of it was the pilots participated in almost every conference call and the Air University professor and the director of communications actually did the legwork and went down and visited a variety of manufacturers and came up with a preferred vendor and a preferred plan of action. <coughs> the uh, chief staff of the Air Force actually took the report, acted on it immediately, and the Air Force is in the process of standing up for the first time in 17 years, a new HF communications plan and network 
they have to go so far as to set up a school to teach people how to use these radios because the only people they've got that know how to use HF right now in the Air Force are called, called Joint Technical Air Controllers, and they jump out of airplanes with the Army and use these radio to change back who will then talk to a satellite to get it back to an air operations center. But I digress. Um, the idea is we've got a pretty full featured communication suite that we try and employ. And that's part of why I'm here. I can use more people who are interested in this sort of thing, who are knowledgeable, and who are good operators. But I want to go through the whole thing and show you a little bit more about what we do. Next slide, please. Over 550 uh, fixed repeaters. We have 152 tactical repeaters in the entire organization in Oklahoma. And I will use both of them next weekend as we rotate airplanes up and down. In fact, I'm probably going to call one, another one in from Kansas. Uh, about 1,000 base stations, over 5,000 uh, mobile radios, 2,500. We've got well, you know, like I said, about 2,000 actually today, uh, HF radios. A lot of the non-ALA radios are now equipped with cell calls, so they can't necessarily call somebody and scan, uh, who is scanning, but they can scan and, and uh, decode a call. So it's almost as good. And we're in the process of getting rid of all of the cell call radios and replacing them with HF ALE. Next slide, please. So this is basically breaking down the HF side of it. The HF mission is evolving because the Air Force mission for HF is evolving. We already participate quarterly on short notice DOD exercises. Some of these, the last one, in fact, the last two, in fact, involved us having to uh, find, suddenly find air crews and put airplanes in the air to go uh, look at notional problems, which meant real flying, which meant really waking people up and saying, hey, we need an air crew right now. So these are not games per se. This is what they would do if we have a really bad day. You know, this is this is sort of the real thing. And why do we do this? We'll get to that slide in just a couple of minutes. But we do the joint exercises. We do a lot of joint exercises with the Air Force and varying things, not just communications. Next slide. So here's the internal network. This is where notionally we have our repeaters. Uh, next slide. It's, it's a lot of repeaters, but like I said, the paradigm's changing. We're going to the ready op uh, repeater linking where the, uh, from a control panel on your cell phone, and all of a sudden control the repeater, turn it into a remote base, or in those places where we have deemed the repeaters no longer necessary, just simply put a mobile radio out there, a base station radio out there, talking to ready off, and it is our remote base. Still with an antenna at 2,000 feet. And we're able to uh, to still communicate with all of our uh, teams in the field, in the air. And we're going to new hardware. The Johnson radios are over 10 years old. Johnson woke up one morning and end of life the thing, the things, and cut off our parts supply. <laughs> Yeah, so our, our national, uh, yeah, they, 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 boom. guess what? We're not selling you parts anymore. So we're cannibalizing Johnson Radios for parts. Sound familiar? 5100s, 5300s on uh, BHL. I, I, I may talk to you about that. So what else do we do? Emergency services. Over 90% of the search and rescue activity in the continental United States, in the homeland, is performed by Civil Air Patrol, as assigned by the uh, Air Force uh, rescue, uh, rescue Coordination Center. Over 90%. For the last five years, that had been over 80%. According to Secretary Wilson, two weeks ago, it has risen to over 90%. We are credited with 147 saves this year. That's not 147 missions. That's 147 souls where we found them alive and were able to get them out. Some of them were lost hikers or horseback riders or what have you. We're involved in homeland security for a variety of aspects, disaster recovery, 
defense support civil authorities. We do drug intervention work, although that money has sort of dried up. That kind of depends on what the states have to offer and what their requirements are. Uh, humanitarian services. We had the first flights in with uh, rescue supplies for Katrina. We had a lot of work that went into uh, finding missing parties during uh, Hurricane Harvey. We didn't do quite so much humanitarian work in, uh, down in Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, primarily because there were so few of us there and getting there was hard for us. Air Force ROTC flights, we do orientation flights for the cadets over at uh, OU. And JROTC flights, if we identify a JROTC group or groups in this area, let me know. We can get them in airplanes. We have an agreement to do that, funds to do it. Our cadet programs uh, focus on leadership, character development, aerospace education, including STEM and physical fitness. We've got standards that, we, that the cadets have to meet for physical fitness before they can advance in rank. And we encourage them to follow those and to advance in rank as regularly as possible. And then aerospace education, we have cap members involved in aerospace education. We've got aerospace education members who are uh, te teachers in school in promoting aerospace. And we will assist them with uh, resources, guest lectures, and uh, support, get them orientation rides as well. And then we also can help uh, educate the general public. Next slide, please. Last year, we did over 600, that was 2016, with over 660 missions. I'm told we did about 800 missions this past year. Uh, 85 saves in 2016, 147 this year. Things have ramped up a little bit. Next slide, please. Our area of operations is border to border and coast to coast, plus Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. If it looks like CONUS, Alaska, Hawaii, or the Caribbean uh, possessions, we're out there. So far, we don't have a uh, squadron in Guam. I don't think anybody saw of it recently. <laughs> component, Air Force component commanders task and approve the mission. So we don't self-deploy. Does anyone here self-deploy? Good answer, thank you. <laughs> we don't self-deploy. We don't pop up and say, hey, we want to go do this. In fact, if we hear an ELT while we're flying, and personally when I'm flying, I'm always listening to 121.5, I call and say, I've heard an ELT, and it gets reported back up the chain. This summer, we were at a training event, a two-week training academy, and we had practice ELTs out. About 20 minutes into the practice ELT training, I had an aircraft come on the ELT and ask us what they wanted to do. We set it up the, up the chain. It went to the Air Force uh, Rescue Coordination Center. They pushed it around. It went to NOAA, who verified it was a satellite. And it went to the FAA to see if we had any missing airplanes. They didn't know of any, but they asked us. And we went and found that somebody had framed the landing and put his airplane away with the ELT still before. It happens a lot. Most of our ELT missions are hard landings. But for those few that aren't, the last, the last live downed aircraft, you remember the, uh, the, evac the uh, medevac helicopter that uh, crashed a couple of years ago? That was the last live one in Oklahoma. We were first in on the scene with an aircraft in bad weather, identified the location and put a ground team in bad weather in there, who secured the aircraft and turned it in. We couldn't turn off the ELT because the owner did not want us to damage the, uh, the helicopter anymore. That was a futile attempt at salvaging sheep metal. Oh, probably 400 a year that are real downed airplanes of one sort or another. Somebody went down in, in, a, in a bad spot and punched the button and asked for help. That happens. We go looking for them. Somebody lands on a mountainside because for real lands because they couldn't get around the wind, uh, with the winds and the altitude. We found a Cirrus that way two years ago. They had done a very nice soft landing in the snow, broke the airplane a little bit, did not break the people, but if they had been left to their own devices, they could not hike out. We were able to 
find them, get a, a, a rescue helicopter in to pull them out so that they could come home. Yeah, like it says, we fly 60 to 80 percent of the first Air Force daily sorties. No, well, we, we do 90 percent of all inland search and rescue. Uh, we're tasked by the coordination center. That's how we get our orders. We actually take orders, and at the point we start in person or a uh, an ELP search, we are the Air Force Arrival 10, it's an official Air Force mission. We are in a CAP uniform, and we're we are on Air Force orders. Next slide. We have about 32,000 people, maybe 35,000 now, who are actively involved in operations. We've got about 600 qualified incident commanders. About half of those are probably people that I would really <coughs> with on a major incident. We've got about 3,000 qualified mission pilots. That varies. Right now, how many pilots do I have in here? Cool. <laughs> Gold mine. Yeah, if you got more than a couple of hundred hours, come play. Turn you into a qualified mission pilot. Oklahoma needs a few more mission pilots right now. Uh, we also have transport pilots, and uh, we, we delineate by VFR and IFR capabilities. But the mission pilots are the ones who actually fly the search and rescue missions because they require a little more skill, a little more finesse, and they are checked out a little more closely. We've got about 6,000 other air crew members. Our typical flight air crew complement is a pilot, a mission observer who's nominally the uh, commander of, of that sortie, and a scanner. The mission observer is in the right seat up front. The scanner is in the left seat in the back. The pilot is expected to maintain safety of flight by the airplane and not have to do everything. So we actually engage in crew resource management, and we mean it. The times we haven't engaged in crew resource management haven't always ended well. Safety is a big aspect for us in virtually everything we do. We've got four to 5,000 ground team members across the country. We have over 2,000 law enforcement officers who are also members of CAP. And for some variety of communications operators, we've got about 23,000 who are officially certified. We also have a chaplain's corps, and we've started building that chaplain's corps because there's a, a, a problem with maintaining chaplains in the Air Force right now. Our chaplains can request to go on, uh, on an extended uh, duty assignment with the Air Force and are recognized by the Air Force's chaplains. They won't be deployed overseas, but they can handle uh, operations in country here. So, next slide. So here's why we're flying to the Air Force in a lot of cases. We're cheap. A 172 is about 165 bucks an hour. A 182 can be upwards of 300 an hour, or 182 to 206, maybe 300 an hour, worst case. The MQ-1 is gone. The MQ-9 is about $3,000 an hour. So it's about five times as expensive as the MQ-1. It's burning all that air, that turbine fuel that does that. The uh, HH-60 Golf, which is the rescue helicopter, is about $8,000, I'm sorry, about $10,000 an hour in today's dollars. And the uh, C-130, we don't have any more ease in the inventory, so the, uh, the C-130J is about $12,000 to $15,000 an hour. We're a smoking deal. We can go out, we can move, well, we have paperwork, so we can't move much faster than the Air Force, but a little faster than the Air Force to get going. And then we can go ahead and fly cheaper and frequently sustain on our mission longer than they can before they have to come back and get gas or they have to go ask for refueling from an AWAC, uh, from a, uh, a uh, refueling bird. That poses its own set of expenses and problems. Next slide, please. And here is the convoluted mechanism in which we get tasked for, uh, for defense support to civil authorities. In point of fact, just like the Guard, state of Oklahoma can ask for us up front and say, yeah, we'll pay for it and we'll get uh, put on orders pretty quickly. But as the request moves up 
to uh, FEMA and from FEMA you know, uh, to uh, SECDEF for defense support for civil authorities. In other words, let's bring in the reserve, activate the guard into the federal service. CAP would fall into that as well. And then we get pushed back in under the Air Force. We get an order from the Air Force to do this. During Hurricane Harvey, that's what happened. Next slide, please. So if you need get a request for forces, it, it all comes down from Northern Command to First Air Force, Air Force North. And if you really want to learn all these acronyms and stuff, I'll be glad to help you later. It, after you've lived them for a while, and I've been trying to think out of the box and break some of the rules we have into more manageable pieces. So yeah, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with it. That means I'm not saying rational or normal anymore. Let's just accept that and go. What do you need any more? <laughs> I started long before you got moved up here. I know. But once upon a time, I was, well, I guess I was about 12. You were rational at that point? For a 12 year old. Okay. All right. <laughs> We go back a ways. <laughs> um, you know, we get we get tasked. We report all the way back up to North Nome. All of our reports are actually seen by the Air Force. We got excuse me. We got calls during Hurricane Harvey operations from Air Force North and North Nome, wanting to know what we were looking at, why we were putting planes in this region. They had heard a report that we needed to be over here. They weren't retasking us. They wanted to report, but our reports actually do get all the way up. You know, we can have tasking come from federal agencies. We will respond to tasking for any, from any federal agency, not just FEMA. Homeland Security, Department of the Army, who have you. Uh, you know, if, if Health and Human Services has a reason for us to come and do something like transporting drugs, supplies, organs, what, whatever, yes, we can do that. Well, we respond to, to federal agency tasking, DOD tasking, and local tasking, but it has to go through channels. Next slide, please. So how much of this is uh, DSCA, Defense Support Civil Authorities? Uh, if you take a look here, about 40, uh, about 13% uh, of our activities are search and rescue. We do range support for places like Fort Sill, uh, Fort Bliss, uh, Fort Hood. Places that you know that they want range support, they want to want to have eyeballs on what's going on out there. We do uh, that means we look for uh, fires that are started by artillery shells. Occasionally, we go looking for missing uh, soldiers. Uh, air defense and set. I was going to talk about this in a later slide, but I'll mention it now. I've already mentioned earlier. We also fly uh, low-level uh, runs down in, uh, along the border. Recalibrates and the electronics involved in maintenance radar to make sure that if we have an, uh, an adversary coming across the border, our forces can, find, can see them on the radar and can intercept them in an appropriate manner. That's an annual mission that uh, Oklahoma puts two air, one to two aircraft and air crews down on every year. It's usually a two week deployment. And yeah, that's a full Air Force mission. Counter drug has been going down quite a bit. Disaster relief and low level surveys, we do a lot of those. We also do low level route surveys for the Air Force because they want to put airplanes down at NAPA, the Earth level, and fly at speeds way faster than we can fly. They prefer that we identify the, the uh, power lines and antennas that have gone up and since the last survey before one of their jets does. <laughs> it, Expendable? No, we try and avoid it. You know, we, we, uh, we, we've got what we call a hard base that we can't descend below, and that should be above any tower that we run across. But you know, they, they would like to know that, and they go below our hard base when sometimes when they're flying really fast. Homeland Security, 8%. Surrogate Predator, that one's growing. That one's going to become a big part of our mission. That one isn't just pilot and observer time. We also put a uh, 
put an incident command crew in, at least for communications, logistics, planning, and uh, a uh, commander in place. And these are at the military facility so that we are interfacing directly with the uh, military authorities at the same time. Next slide, please. Stage. Search and rescue operations. What do we do? We fly low, we fly slow. Typically a thousand feet above the ground level at less than eight, at 85 to 90 knots. You notice the flaps are deployed on that airplane. You don't fly a 182 at 85 to 90 knots stably unless you've got power pulled way back and the flaps deployed. But that gives us more time to look. All of our aircraft. Most of our aircraft, a couple of the new ones don't have it, have a, a ELT uh, direction finding equipment built in that's really pretty nice and pretty accurate. I have been able to quarter, the, well, the last ELT mission I flew, I was able to identify the hangar that the ELT was stashed in, where the airplane was at, it had actually been put away in, on an airport out of about a dozen hangers. And I was able to just quarter it and find, actually find that from, we're allowed to go down to 5,000 feet when we got a signal like that. We were down to five, or I'm sorry, 500. So we were down to 500 feet and I could say, it's that hangar. And when our ground crew got there, they got access to that hangar and found that airplane. We actually have uh, Elvers, which is that little yellow thing with antennas on it which allow us to do uh, direction finding. The direction finding in relatively short range is a pretty good uh, system for uh, getting in and, and being able to walk right to an ELT or another uh, system. Our aircraft now, by the way, all capabilities, so they can look at the EPIRBs. We got the wherewithal to go looking for somebody who's now got a personal beacon, or the new aircraft have 406 beacons on them, but theoretically tell us who they are, where they are, and what altitude they're at, and what the coordinates are, and all sorts of information. Sometimes it works. But they also have a very low power 121.5 beacon that allows us, once we figure out more or less where they are, to get in and get a whole lot closer to them by should find. Uh, we do put ground teams out. We do line searches on the ground where we actually have people looking for clues walking in a line together and actually using proper technique to do the ground searches. If you take a look up in the, uh, in your upper left, that's what an airplane can look like after it has turned, you know, gone from a, a nice set of wings and such into a ball of aluminum. And that's kind of hard to spot. That's one of the tasks we face. The uh, other thing we do is we do cell phone forensics. How many people have a cell phone? <laughs> How many people actually turn your cell phone off when you get in an airplane? Really? I sleep. <laughs> well, about 5,000 feet is probably not going to work anyway, but that's just because of the physics associated with the antennas. We have agreements with all of the uh, cell phone providers, and they give us data on sector information. Uh, if we've got a phone number and we know who the carrier is, we can go to that carrier and say, we are working a missing person and we're civil air patrol. Our cell phone forensics team will get the data from the carriers. Some are better than others. Right now, Verizon actually has about the best data from all of its cell sites to help us locate. But we can narrow down a most likely area to search pretty quickly. And uh, our cell phone forensics team was actually working during the national conference for CAP two weeks ago. So they were unable to attend, but we got word during the banquet that they had participated in uh, saving two more people who had gotten lost, hadn't been seen in almost 48 hours, but their cell phones told us where to go look. We put teams out, we found them. Next slide, please. 147 saves this year. I keep saying that. That's a big number. We're doing a pretty good job. We try and ramp it up. Yeah, the, we try and do a credible job every year. 
And this is evidence that we seem to be doing something right. Next slide, please. The cell phone forensics mission has started in uh, 2006. Now, this is a big deal because there are a lot of people that do cell phone forensics. Most of them do it for security violations, you know, the FBI. We do it to find missing people. We have some agents uh, you know, that we get support uh, uh, for CONUS searches. It's very much like the support people request for air and ground searches for missing people. It's all started as an adjunct, a last resort for lo uh, locating overdue aircraft. Now it's one of the primary tools to try and figure out where to go look. Because if we know that there is a, somebody missing and an airplane that's delayed, if we if they we just make the assumption they have a cell phone, we get their cell phone number, we start looking for where it is. If we can find a location where they have recently pinged, we're going to call their cell phone. Hey, are you okay? Oh, yeah. Did you close your flight plan? Oh, no, I didn't close my flight plan. Okay, well, your, air, your flight plan didn't close, your airplane didn't show up where we expected it to be, so what's going on? And we take care of it. Some agencies solely request cell, uh, cell forensics from us and don't need any other help because they can send out their own people. Police, fire, can send out their own people and take care of it at that point. They don't request any other federal assets at that point to do, to do their work. Next slide, please. Disaster relief operations, what do we do? We fly over areas, well, volcanic eruptions, uh, tornadoes, uh, storm surge flooding, uh, uh, damage, damage, lightning damage, or potential other uh, explosions at, at uh, major plants. We can take aerial photography of that. We have resources to do that with uh, traditional still imagery, with videography, and we have the ability now in some of our wings, and we're trying to expand that to all of our wings, to actually get the data back in very near real time to FEMA and the USGS, who hosts the servers for the uh, for this project. So that they can be seen by the people who need them, FEMA, uh, the Air Force, Department of the Army, um, whoever, Homeland Security, whoever happens to request them. This gives us, these are also, uh, especially with the real time stuff, these are geo rectified and geo registered. So when you look at that picture, you know where it is, you know what it was, you know it's near real time anyway, but it's a good shot. And that's a fairly new project. We had an old project that never worked right. Guard Bureau uh, took a look at that and said, you know, this is really a great idea. Let's throw money at it. It's officially a, a Guard Bureau project at the national level. But Civil Air Patrol is, is explicitly named in it as a player because we had originated the, the old program called Chief. Next slide, please. So what else did we do? Hurricane Harvey. I was part of Hurricane Harvey response. Hurricane Harvey response was requested of Civil Air Patrol on the uh, day preceding the start of our national conference when we had some pre-conference activities going on. And they set up an incident command post and started uh, figuring out what we needed to do. They asked for, uh, for uh, flight crews, and I went down to volunteer as, as air crew and got pulled in as part of the incident team to go out to the San Marcos Airport. They sent four of us out to take over operations out there, launch airplanes, get the mission done. I did primarily communications, but the four of us that were out there did whatever needed to be done in the entire incident command process, from aircraft operations to maintenance, to logistics, to planning, to communications. We had one guy in charge, but he's probably the best leader for that sort of thing I've ever worked with. And I have got to work with him again this summer at uh, the National Encampment. We had 626 members who were represented in that, either at uh, the incident command, the primary incident command post started at the hotel in San Antonio. There were about 25 people associated with that. There were 626 members encompassed flight crews, Ground personnel from the Houston area, uh, Houston, Beaumont, and out into Louisiana. 
We had 44 wings involved, 71 aircraft, which included uh, about 10 sorties, a little over 10 sorties per aircraft. So almost a lot. The first day we took over 85,000 photos. We did 376,000 photos, and I think that number is actually low before we were all said and done. That operation ran for 62 days. Uh, Hurricane Irma, we had about 245 members. That was primarily Florida. What can happen in Florida? Well, the, the whole peninsula can go under water. With about 12 wings responded to that, that was a more localized response. We were already gearing up for uh, Maria. And for that matter, we actually sent an incident command team down to Puerto Rico because uh, Irma had hammered the northern aspects of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. There was significant work that had to be done down there. Uh, 28 aircraft, 136 sorties, so they, they were busy. And we took about 40,000 uh, photos in, in uh, Irma. Next slide, please. Maria, 252 members, 14 wings, 25 aircraft, 300 sorties, 82,000 photos. It's a much smaller area than Hurricane Harvey's face or the, uh, <coughs> or the uh, uh, Peninsula of Florida. So you can get by with, few, with, with fewer photographs. They only had two native aircraft down there. We had to actually ferry <laughs> aircraft down to get 25 airplanes down there. Interestingly, they had sheltered their aircraft in a hangar with the uh, air guard at the main air base. And that hangar was rated for a Category 3 storm. Mm -hmm. Maria landed as a Category 5 storm on uh, Puerto Rico. Most of that hangar was destroyed. 9-11 C-130s were destroyed. And two remained mission capable, and both of the CAP aircraft remained mission capable once they pulled the damaged hangar parts away and could get the aircraft out. They did that. They were flying the second day. Communications down there. One of the communicators, who also happened to be a medical technologist at the uh, the uh, big hospital in San Juan set up a mag loop outside and established communications on the first day back to the mainland. That was the primary communications mechanism Civil Air Patrol had for about five days until uh, the guard response, uh, guard reserve response got in there and set up satellites. And we maintained that and maintained mission continuity throughout the entire time we had people down there. For the Maria response, we sent air crews, aircraft, and only a few um, missions, uh, missions support staff. The commander down there, but we actually did a distributed incident command post. We had people all over the country rotating shift, rotating rocks, a lot of Skype hangouts the entire system and it worked it's possible it's possible to actually do an incident uh, by having everybody remote as long as they are on the same page they know what's going on next slide please. hurricane harvey we had command posts at the marriott riverwalk in san antonio on the fourth floor san marcus airport ellington field in houston and eventually in denton we flew, uh, actually flew flight operations out of San Marcos and Ellington, eventually out of Conroe, but not much out of there. 62 days of operation. Next slide, please. You say Denton? Denton. Isn't that a little outside of where you were working at? It is. Everything we did was outside. Ellington was the only one we did inside the, uh, the actual area of operation because we had less impact on the recovery effort if we were outside of the area of operation. And our incident commander had the resources of FEMA Region 6, the big facility there, and he lives in Denton. So it was more convenient for him when all he had to do was push paper and task people to go do things to be in Denton and back home and sleep in his own bed for a few hours each night. But yeah, it was outside of the area of operations. 
We flew aircraft from San Marcos down into the, the uh, Rio Grande Valley, down around Corpus Christi, all the way up around the coastal bend and all the way into Louisiana and had to establish logistics points for them to refuel. Because if we had tried to stage a whole bunch of aircraft, when I left, we had 44 airplanes on the ground at San Marcos. We had the tower complaining that CAP had taken over their airfield. <laughs> We ran that airport out of gas the first day of operations. <laughs> Completely ran two fixed base operators out of gas. As I was leaving that night about well, that, the next morning at about 1 a.m., there was a line of fuel tankers to refuel the two fixed FBO, the fixed base operators underground fuel tanks. Four fuel tankers in a line coming in to refuel them. They had not anticipated that we would drain their tanks. <laughs> if we had done that in Houston, they couldn't have gotten the fuel in. So, yeah, it was outside of our, our area of operations, but the incident command post doesn't always have to be right there if you've got good communications. Well, we had good communication. Yeah, for, for Maria, as I said, we did a, a virtual command staff all over the place, we, but we had all of the positions filled that, were, that we needed. And if you'll recall from your NIMS training, not all positions have to be filled. Some of them can be uh, delegated to another person or can be assumed by the incident commander. Uh, we had an incident commander physically in Puerto Rico the whole time. We had people dispersed across the uh, nation. It was set up. It was the brainchild of the guy I worked with at uh, Harvey down in San Marcos who said, I know how to do this. Let me set it up. And his girlfriend described it as, well, I went on a trip. She flies for American. She says, I came back and the back of the house didn't look like my house anymore. It looked like it was a command post. And it had all these no, network it things. It was. He had he had, uh, reconfigured it so that he had, uh, I think she said, eight monitors, a couple of cameras, network equipment. He had another internet connection brought in at the commercial level. And he was managing everything, all of the network stuff from his house. We had a lot of stuff that happened on Google Docs for that. It was actually an interesting trial. I started using those this summer at the encampment, worked well. So the next time, one of the lessons we learned is next time we need to send a communicator with the incident commander because most of our incident commanders don't speak radio real well. <laughs> and we had an incident commander who tried to say, oh, this, this HF radio doesn't work. The translation of that was, I don't know how to use this HF radio. So the fix for that is to send somebody who does know how to use the HF radio and let them be the liaison for the communications. Next, please. Aerial photography is one of the top things we do. That's what, you know, the weather service, if they want uh, damage assessment photos right after a tornado, who are they going to call? We have to make a call up to the knock at Tyndall and say, we've got a request from the weather service and they confirm they don't have to go any higher, it's already done. Uh, we actually have some aircraft that have predator style balls on them that allow us to take uh, infrared and uh, still photography and, and get some really high risk stuff. Next slide, please. We do air defense exercises where we fly into restricted airspace and are intercepted by things that uh, shoot missiles and bullets and fly very fast. And uh, we do play by all their rules. But yeah, you, it, 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 it's an interesting out to see that F-16 with all the gear hanging down, trying to stay at your airspeed, <laughs> hailing you on 121.5 and telling you to land. Once they see us, once they establish who we are, it's all okay. But next slide, please. 200 and intercept training missions annually. These are not just one flight uh, missions. They're typically a bunch of flights. Uh, we serve as targets to allow units to train and be evaluated for intercepting general aviation aircraft, especially in the New York and uh, Washington, D.C. corridors, but it's expanding. 
And we uh, train with ground uh, air defense radar uh, across the country uh, where they have the need to uh, be brought up to speed. We also have a mission uh, uh, for Rucker where they need to train their uh, ground control radar people so that they can do ground control intercept uh, approaches. They don't get much practice with that because the helicopter drivers don't really want to train them and they're all students anyway. So it then flies about 800 hours a year flying approaches for these guys and doing their, uh, getting ground rays where we're looking for things like towers that might have cropped up. Not all towers go into the database. The database, even when it's updated, isn't always right. Uh, the last time I owned a copy of that da database, most of it was, well, not most of it, probably 20% of it was fiction based on what I could survey just in within 150 or 200 miles of, of where I was at the time. So we these low level routes and you know, mark them on a map, bring them back, tell the Air Force, tell them, they tell the FAA, they get updated, things get better. We also do range support. Range support's important because fires break out when you uh, shoot uh, high explosive artillery or uh, white phosphorus rounds out on a range. And somebody's gotta go out and put that out and it becomes a wildfire. Fort Hood was a prime example of that about 10 years ago. They burned, uh, about a third of Central Texas in the process. Next slide, please. Well, we have a couple of 182 Qs, which are the round dial, the old steam. What we call steam 182s now actually have glass cockpits, G1000 glass. But these have don't have the glass because it's heavy. So they've gone back, and these are surrogate unmanned. Uh, aircraft we can actually put an operator in the back and the uh pilot on the ground and the uh, uh the uh, payload operator on the ground issue commands and our guy in the back seat executes those commands as if it, it was a real predator or a real uh, reaper it's how we train they actually want to expand that training and put uh more people physically in the aircraft to uh, be able to do the training in the aircraft <laughs> So that the uh, payload operators would be able to uh, run the payload from inside the plane. We're looking at new aircraft to do that. Uh, where, where are we doing it? Nevada, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Hopefully, I'll never have to go there. And uh, these can also be used for uh, defense support for civil authorities. For Hurricane Harvey, we flew, I want to say, 28 hours uh, using these aircraft getting uh, additional high resolution images of uh, the damage in the immediate Houston downtown area. Next slide, please. High resolution sensors. You can almost read the license plates. I'm told to on some of the images you can, but I'm not allowed to see those. But you can see we've got daylight, infrared capability, and narrow spotter. I want the infrared capability on a regular basis because most of the uh, search missions we do are missing persons. I want to be able to go out and look for that body signature because we have a better chance of finding people faster here in Oklahoma. Next slide. Base perimeter patrols, uh, remote pilot aircraft, and UAV escort. We've talked about that. Accident, incident, response. For the T uh, 38 that went involved, but they knew exactly where that happened. They had good reports and they already had the pilot. We didn't need to be involved. You know, where, where do our people come from? We got doctors, we got cops. We have a meteorologist or two. We have computer geeks, we have network geeks. We have graphics people. We have administrators. We, we come from all walks of life. If you're interested, talk to me. Next slide, please. Homeland Security, we can find little things, we can support Homeland Security missions, we do that on a fairly regular basis. Uh, not so much in this state, because we're landlocked, we're flyover state, they haven't called us for anything. But if we had another terrorist incident in downtown Oklahoma, I pretty well guarantee you they'll have us overflying the area and uh, supporting that. 
One of the things that we do support is presidential TFRs, uh, temporary flight restrictions. If we have a VIP coming into the area and they're concerned enough to actually have significant air defense coverage in the area, we're likely to be in the intercept of light aircraft that have violated the airspace, get eyeballs on them, and be able to tell the uh, Department of Defense people and the Homeland Security <coughs> people what we're seeing from a safe distance so that they can call in the appropriate uh, response, <coughs> whether it's something that goes fast and shoots guns or whether it's a, a helicopter that simply intercepts them and demands that they, uh, that they land. Next slide, please. Counter drug missions. We have pulled, this number is about stable, according to what I heard a couple of weeks ago, still about 1.2 to $1.3 billion worth of uh, drugs and illicit currency in the last year. In Oklahoma, that mission has, is still alive, but it has uh, decreased because of uh, uh, spending cuts. Next slide. Uh, slide. Next slide. Cat, uh, cadet programs. These include leadership programs, we have training programs where we teach uh, the kids through our squadrons and through encampments and leadership training, formal leadership training, uh, how to advance, how to become good leaders, what the elements of some good leadership actually are. Uh, we have glider programs, which are primarily for the cadets, but some of which can also uh, become certain. Uh, challenge courses, yes. It is possible on some of our training encampments in summertime and sometimes the winter encampments to do things like go off a repelling tower and figure out that you really can safely make it to the ground with nothing but a piece of string. We train our, we train our people up to be able to do ground surveys. Damage assessments and surveys on the ground are an important element of what we do and an important element of supporting our communities. Next slide, please. We have special activities that try to inspire the cadets to do uh, special careers. We would honestly like to see cadets go, uh, advance into the Air Force. But you know, if they're not going to go into the Air Force, I want to see them go into a STEM education program or continue their education in whatever is attractive to them and go do something wonderful. That's, you know, the, the, they need to find something that's interesting and have fun with it. But that, you know, that, 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 that's my goal. I'm a little selfish that way. This is uh, an example of somebody getting a ride on a fancy airplane. During our encampment in Oklahoma last year, uh, we had uh, the cadets get to go over to Alpha's Air Force Base, and all of them got on C-17s, and uh, they uh, did it out and back over to Colorado. Except for one group that ended up getting retasked on a mission, and they were gone for about 14 hours because they had to go uh, retrieve something, take it someplace, and then come back to it uh, to Alpha's. So, yeah, they got to see something special. They got to see something really different. Next slide. It's about Everything we have been involved with, Cyber Patriot is a, uh, an infrastructure and network security uh, operation at the uh, high school level. CAP has been active in that. We have been competing with uh, service academies, against service academies and against uh, some other specialty groups. And we've got a team in Colorado Springs that seems to be, let's see, uh, eight out of the last nine years they've made the finals, two out of the last... Uh, Four years, they have won the competition. This is an Air Force Association sponsored competition in concert with a couple of three letter acronyms in the DC Beltway area. And they are really serious about trying to improve the quality of our uh, capabilities within the government and within the, uh, the services to support cyber attack, uh, to be able to defend against cyber attack. We don't teach them to hack, but we do teach them. We're trying to bring them up right. We're teaching them to be radio operators. Some units actually are holding ham radio classes. I've sent a couple of our senior members down here for classes, but we're not ham radio 
in that sense. Yeah. I can explain that. I, I could go on with the lectures I got about uh, about that when I first joined CAP. It started with, oh, you're a ham operator. Well, you don't know anything about the way we talk on radio is there. <laughs> Actually, I did, but that had to be demonstrated <coughs> rather than accepted. But we do teach them to be radio operators. Probably the best radio operator I have in Oklahoma right now <coughs> is a young lady age 50 out of the Edmond area who decided she liked being in the communications staff. Not only is she a good operator, she's got good handwriting so I can read her logs. I can read the messages she takes. She's my best trainer. She'll take cadet older than her, a cadet younger than her, a senior member, a senior member with an attitude, and she can teach them to do what we need on the radio. It may take her an exercise or two to do it, but she's she's a winner. I don't want you know, I don't want to see her go away. If her family moves out of Oklahoma, I'm going to be in trouble. We put them out on ground teams. We have uh, a flight academy here in Oklahoma every summer. The goal is any cadet 16 or older solos by the end of that flight account. And we have a new program with uh, several million dollars from the Air Force to offer scholarships for flight training. Flight training through CAP, the instructors are free. So there's a lot, a lot of potential here. We actually do intend to see our people follow common, uh, learn military courtesies, and that includes the seniors. We have a variety of uniforms, so for those of us who don't always meet the height and weight requirements, we got a way to deal with that. The uh, service style uniforms require meeting height and weight requirements, and some people wear them on a regular basis. My favorite uniform, I'll be honest, is the ABUs because I don't have to bother cleaning and pressing. The, if they look like they were slept in, they're perfect. <laughs> and they've got a lot of pockets. Next slide, please. STEM initiatives. We do a lot of STEM initiatives within Civil Air Patrol. They have an entire room. We have the ability, if we've got groups, if you already know, in the schools, in the clubs, who want to, uh, to start working on STEM, we can help. Civil Air Patrol can help. Uh, rocketry, small. Uh, unmanned aircraft, quadcopters and drones, astronomy, weather. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything associated with surveying in STEM kits, but obviously somebody's doing it. There's no reason we can't. We can invent a STEM activity for almost anything. Aerospace education is a big one for us. We try and push that a lot. Next slide, please. Uh, our connections in education actually attempts to reach out to educators and connect to as many kids as we possibly can. Next slide. That's, that's pilot training. <laughs> uh, well, for the Air Force Academy, yeah. <laughs> we got to get them young. Yeah, you know, the bottom line, we're ready, willing, and able to assist. We've got trained professionals. Yeah, we're, we're volunteers, but that doesn't mean that we don't know how to do our job. And we can do the laundry list. We can do reconnaissance. We can't do surveillance. Why can we not do surveillance? Anybody want to take a guess? Legal. Legal, security. The, a whole bunch of rules come into a play when you say you're doing surveillance. So we don't do surveillance. We can do reconnaissance. We don't do intelligence for the same reason. Um, intercept training. Communication support. We can do formal and informal uh, message handling on, at the drop of a hat. If you want to see that, come visit me next weekend in this room right here, starting about 8 a.m. And we'll see what we can do. Chaplain services, low-level surveys. We do pre-flight, uh, pre-show pre surveys for the Thunderbirds. Somebody's got to go out and figure out where the towers and hills are. We prefer that they not do it at 400 knots. <laughs> They're going to do it. 400 knots of rocks 
We have stress response teams, critical incident management, uh, or critical incident stress management teams. We have training for that, formal training. Uh, we can do crowd control type work. At the uh, last Tinker Air Show last year, we actually were a major element of crowd control uh, supporting security services out there on the headlines. It was the cadets that were keeping uh, the crowds from getting beyond where they were supposed to be. If they had a problem, they had a radio and somebody with a little push. Then basically they said, the cadet told you to get back. Please get back. Shelter management, we can do that. That's not in my wheelhouse, so I, I try and stay away from that. I'm, I'm usually more in the incident command stop side. Uh, we have an exercise evaluation support team for, Air Force, uh, for the Air Force personnel and for our own folks. We're effectively a, a uh, force multiplier for the Air Force, is what it comes down to, but we also are a force multiplier for the communities. Next slide, please. And community-based uh, aviation. We don't have any balloons that I'm aware of in Oklahoma. Nobody's talked about it in the seven years I've been involved which means nobody's talked about it. No, we don't have a for uh, CAP, but we do have a couple of balloon pilots within CAP. Next slide, please. That's it. Questions? Sir? <coughs> We've got a couple of uh, youth here, also in front of the grandkids that uh, are possibly interested in some of control. Explain to them what the advantage of the food and which it would be. You go in as an E3. Exactly. You go in as an E3 with real income. Uh, we, in fact, our best example of that was our last uh, Mitchell awardee who went in, graduated eventually at the top of his uh, basic class, and got his pick on what he wanted to do. He's supporting the F 22 Raptor in maintenance now. Uh, about, I want to say, 50, 50 or 60 percent of the folks who go to the Air Force Academy have had uh, time in civil air patrol. There, you'd be amazed at the number of people I've run into at the Air Force who uh, come in and say, oh yeah, I was in CAP back when. I know what you're doing. Yes, we'll help. Uh, <coughs> there are benefits in advancing in Civil Air Patrol as a cadet. You learn things. You learn how to do stuff. You learn how to lead. And there are tangible benefits like this Mitchell Award. We have a series of awards as you advance through the ranks. As you become a cadet officer, you're recognized as having leadership capabilities. Gentlemen who came from our squadron, went to basic, went in as an E3, was tagged as a leader by his uh, uh, <coughs> drill instructor. He's been in, he's up for, I'm sorry, he should be E6 by now. He was up for E6 last time I talked to him. And he was just waiting for, uh, for the uh, results. Oh, and his current duty assignment is Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> suffering, for, okay, suffering for the Air Force. Yeah. Um, as you advance further, you, uh, you you get even more Air Force. There's an award called the Spots Award. That's when that's the highest award a cadet can win. Yes, uh, it's the highest award a cadet can win. The Spots Award is recognized as the pinnacle achievement for the cadets. Frequently, it's awarded by a senior Air Force officer at uh, a uh, wing conference or a national conference. We had two awards in uh, Anaheim, California this year. And it's, yet yeah, folks who do that are really and truly impressive. I've known, had the privilege of knowing several of them and these are cadets that are going to go places and do great things. You also end up with benefits uh, from the spots if, if you enlist or if you go ahead to uh, ROTC. And 
it's recognized when you go into the service at as bracket duty as well. What else? <coughs> if I've got anybody who's interested, please talk to me. Yes? Another question? Somebody got their hand raised. Back. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wondered if you ever worked with the Coast Guard. We have a number of people who work with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. We haven't had many calls from here in Oklahoma, but that's sort of on my well, where are you going to see them? The lakes. The lakes. <coughs> we also have navigable rivers. And so, yeah, they, 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 have, they have a mission here. Uh, we have, they're, they're on my list of folks to talk to. I'm starting to contact a few <coughs> other agencies. Like I said, Gar the, uh, the military agency here in Oklahoma, the Guard the Gar Bureau, because we need to be interfacing with them more directly. Uh, but Coast Guard Auxiliary is also on that list because if they need something we can provide, maybe we ought to be working with them so that we know how to talk to them and get there. Their frequencies are programmed into our code plug. So, yeah, can I get there? Yeah, sure can. Do you, uh, you work with me at all with Mars? That's a, an interesting question. The Mars has adopted a different philosophy and they have a different mission with the Air Force than we have. So what we are doing with Mars is coexisting and we have some people who are tasked within CAP to actually join Mars Nets with the street Mars call signs and pass traffic back and forth, but not everybody. Uh, so the yeah, we are, but it, it's not widespread. We have a lot of people who are both who are ham operators, CAP people, and farm members. All three, and that's a good thing. But if not all of them are tasked officially with being the liaisons back and forth. It's typically typically people who are in our, our tribal aid system, the national network system, who are tasked to go back and forth. We also interface on 60 meters with the uh, uh, with FEMA and can go back and forth with uh, with them. But again, we try and restrict it to selected people who know how to play the game properly. Might, might be using their procedures instead of our procedures. If anyone's interested, if you've got kids who are interested, please talk to me. In 5JXS at AWRL.org will work. Or I can give you all sorts of long and confusing uh, email addresses. You're going to be right. You're good on Tuesday. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact. But my uh, call sign in CAP is not going to be Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jerry. Very interesting. Cool pictures of, of uh, airplanes is a big benefit for me. Um, I've got one or two things to wrap up. We've got some stuff for sale. Does anybody else have anything they wish to sell? Uh, states for sale? Uh, there's a new event. New event is. Uh, there's some good stuff up here. Come purchase, come look at it, take a look. And uh, for those of you that have been in the room, we have uh, we've done a first test of a YouTube Live. Uh, and that's what you see behind me is uh, broadcasting out to the world. We've got like, two people, uh, Randy, Randy and uh, Justin, will be testing it. Uh, but the goal was to do that where we put these uh, meetings out. Put them up live on the web. As soon as we get done, it'll pop a video up there. I'm sure uh, Michelle's video is going to be much more awesome than the presentations, but uh, because you know she moved the camera and stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, if, Let me make everybody busy. but if you uh, if you have time throughout the week, go to uh, w5nor.org/youtube, or uh, right now it's on the front page, uh, and that will that will hopefully we keep doing that so that if you can't make a meeting, you can pop in. And uh, grab the information uh, either live or on videotape. And feel free to share it with your friends. Videotape. 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 Yes. Order in the radic for 40 inch video. Our next wonderful presenter is Bob here. 
Bob, yeah, there you go. Know. I saw him go up. Bob Roberts is going to be our next presenter in October, which is going to be on WinLink using amateur radio for emails and presentation, which I'm personally looking forward to. If you want to play along a little early, we'll get you a, a, your email signed up at winlink.org, and we'll see you next uh, next month. Anybody have anything? No siren net. No siren net in either city, state, county that we provide. No guts, no glory. No guts, no glory. Dave Galen doesn't want to get back on TV again. My wife said we did a great job. Um, yes, sir. Lawrence. There's a couple of radios on the easy so these radios on this east end and the antennas in the box are free. And there's a note that says replace the cable. So I'm sure that will give somebody help. Thank you very much, Lauren. Appreciate it. Anybody else would be good? Or are we uh, done for the week, month? See you on the 25th, hopefully, at the Red Cross. <laughs> or back here in about two. Our fall picnic will be next month. <laughs> next month is the fall picnic. Same day as club meeting. Same day yes. as a club meeting. We just we discussed that, but we'll talk. You get a burger dog and chip. I need people to bring things like the baked salad. Good deal. We need to bring baked goods, cookies, baked beans. Dessert, salads, like you did the last 10 or 12 times. Thank you very much. People will see you a while later. Appreciate it. We need to. He said we're a goat.